I'm, I'm always amazed when I come here, you know, how nice of a place this is. Um, before I get going, uh, last time I was here, I noticed you had this uh, instant, permanent instant gallery, which shows different kind of techniques. So I was thinking I'm, I'm going to donate uh, one of those pieces here. <laughs> uh, it's called uh, a star in a cube, and it comes with uh, a little stand here. And the star in a cube, uh, it's, it's actually interesting. It's called artistic wood turning, which was done in the 18th century in French, and before the before the French Revolution. And the the aristocrats would would basically use it as an entertainment. They have, I don't know, drinking their coffee and cake and having a guy working on the lace, uh, showing different things. Now, then in the, in the French Revolution, their, their choice uh, of toys was, of course, the guillotine, you know, when they chopped down the aristocrats. <laughs> and, but David Springett is the guy who revived it. Uh, he's an English guy, and he wrote this book, uh, Wood turning wizardry and uh, th that was one of the first really nice wood turning books with some um, tapes and uh, then there was another guy uh, Robert Bosco, Robert Bosco from France, he has a beautiful website which also shows he passed away in the meantime but his wife keeps up the website so you can get uh, instructions and drawings if you are interested in this. So I was thinking I donate this here to your library. Uh, it's also interesting for you guys which may like to do a little math. Uh, this cone here, what kind of angle this cone is. So that uh, three sides of the cube touch basically the cone. So I let you guys figure this out. If you think it is 90 degree, it is not. So Kelly, if you want this, can put it up there afterwards. So yeah, this is uh, quite, uh, and you know, and this is just the, the easiest part. And uh, here I made one, if you want to see, it's not done very well, but a cube in a cube in a cube. So it all starts out with one solid cube and it's, it's only turned. So there's no carving or anything. It's just uh, done by turning. So if you're interested, you can take a look at this as well. So um, I was thinking to make my demo today uh, in, in kind of three steps. Uh, talk a little bit about design and layout equipment and material, and then maybe we take a break so you don't have to listen to my Austrian accent for two hours. And then uh, I, we do a little hands-on uh, demo, okay? So layout, uh, what, what I do, a lot of people would say, if, if you take a ball like this, uh, you, you can use some very organic design where you, if you're very good at this, you know, you may would just pencil it in organically yourself. I'm not really that good at this. Uh, my background is mechanical engineering, and so I, I kind of try to engineer these things. So uh, what I use to, uh, to make these leaves is I develop uh, uh, reference lines and a grid and then I draw it in by hand, or I use a template. I used, for example, I think a few years ago, I was here and showed how to make these scoops, if somebody is still here who remembers this. It's a few years ago. We are all a few years older. A few more aches and pains <laughs> by now. But I started out with, with this just doing uh, Paragraphy, I used a ginkgo leaf from my backyard, and uh, from, from here it became more like the carving. Here there was, there was no carving really on this one here. But, so, I, I take 
I uh, wanted to show you this. There was a guy, uh, Bill Smith, and he did a lot of really nice open segmented turnings. And he, de he developed this uh, uh, indexing system. And you were able to download this from the website. And I cannot find this website anymore. But I do have some, some sheets here which you can keep as an as a original. And then if you want to make something like this, you can copy it off. So what you do, basically, uh, let me sh show you the sheets. They, they are just uh, probably, Jerry, you can Jerry. You can probably download it from one of your computers. Uh, so you, you, you measure your, your uh, spindle, and then with a Forstner bit, or you just uh, drill it out on the lathe, you uh, sandwich it between this disc, between the chuck and the spindle. And then I, I use uh, just a simple piece like this, which uh, just moves this away a little. So just uh, picture the disc is, I don't want to take this chuck off now. But it, does it come off easy? Okay, got it. And uh, my, I have at home. I have a one way, so it's a 33 millimeter spindle, and this one is a inch and a quarter, which is about the same. So it may just fits on it. Uh, let's see, yeah, you see, it has to. So make sure there is not too much slop. It should be really. It should be a little tighter than this. So, and what I like with this is, so here you have the disc. I have in my, on my one way, I do have a uh, indexing wheel, but it is very hard to see. And with this one, it goes so much faster. Then you just put this on here. You press it against it and you press, press it against, you see, it has enough friction, so it, it will just stay there. So then, then you just, uh, then I have uh, uh, made a, a tool rest just out of, and you can shape it whatever way you want it. Take this out for a minute. Just put this tool rest on. So if you have now, let's say you are, and put the tailstock on here to hold it in place. If it is finished, put something in here so you don't scratch it, of course. And then with the tool rest, you you make yourself a little scribe and just put this here as a, a collar which you can buy from a fleet farm. So it's always on the same size. And then you just, just uh, you know, work your way through the, through the different indexing. And it makes it so much faster than if you have, uh, is there an indexing wheel on this one here? There is a, with a pin. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it's, uh, and this is really, if you do, and you don't have to be that accurate. You know, you, you only want to develop some reference lines and the grid. And this is a really nice, easy way to do it. So, so what I did is I I did bring two. That's a four, 48 segment, and that's a 36 segments. And because of the open segment of turning, he always has the one in between as well. So this one gets you a long way. So if you want to keep this as a reference, and you, you should just copy it off here, so you always have the original here. So I give you this too. I'll copy it and send it over. 
So uh, I, I actually want to take just a few minutes uh, to talk about, because we're talking about here kind of uh, relief carving. And if you really talk relief carving, it is something a little deeper than this. So I'm actually talking more. I, text, I do some texture, texturing. Is this, uh, should I move it over a little, sort of, OK. And um, there are so many different ways of, of texturing your, your pieces, like this one here. If you are familiar with this, uh, you can uh, texture the, the wood surface. And one easy way is this engraver. This is an engraver from Tremble. It's a little noisy. <laughs> But you can you can put some little dots in it, or if you turn this around like we did it, and this pin comes out, and on uh, you turn the pin around, and you have a round surface, and that gives you this leathery surface when you when you when you just uh, texture the whole area with this uh, with this round pin here. And it gives you this leathery surface. Then, in this case, and that was one when uh, Greg Kulipet was still with us. We did a lot of this uh, experimenting shapes and kind of. Then you burn it and use liming wax. This is just liming wax. And then you wipe it off with some oil. So, and that, that gives you a nice texturing. Another one uh, we did when we had our. Uh, competition, our silo competition, and this is pewter. This is sheet pewter, where, which you can put down, and you, if you really get into it, and I want to get back into it, you can, you can st structure leaves on, on this sheet pewter. And it is put on with a double-sided uh, carpet tape. So it's and it's just incredible how it holds. There's a guy, uh, uh, John Wessel from South Africa. He demonstrated this, and he does just phenomenal pieces. So that's another way of doing it. Here's another piece of sheet pewter. And I was thinking, the ladies there, the last time I saw some ladies, so I bring this in. If you're interested, this is also pewter, casted pewter, for making necklaces. So if you wanted to take a look at this. Uh, one more uh, about a layout, a little. Uh, Kelly gave me this piece of beautiful uh, bird's eye maple. And when I had it first, I thought, no, you, you know, if you have a piece, nice piece of wood, you shouldn't really do any texturing <laughs> on it. You just let the wood speak. But. I did decide to make a small band here, and I think it does enhance it. Just making, not doing the whole thing because it, you want to see the bird's eye maple. And then I do a lot, I, I just do the bottom of it, you know, and people say, well, you don't really see it, but I, I just like when people turn it over and say, oh, it looks actually nice to have a nice bottom. So, so here, here again, I kind of, I kind of structured it. Because uh, I wasn't quite sure how to do it. Should I? Should I? Should I make it more uh, natural, more organic flowing? But then I just said no. And here again, I just uh, uh, used reference lines, and kind of each leaf is about the same. And that's the other thing. If you if you have a good feel where you can use uh, your own your own flow. Uh, and you start on one side and you end on the other side, it usually you can see you start here and you end here. So you would have to randomly change it from one side to the other one. Then you get the more natural flow. Let me just uh, say if you have a ball like this, I'm just showing half of it. So if you if your leaves, if you make leaves like this, and they come in in a very in a very natural way, that would be probably looking really nice. But 
Don't start on one side and end on the other side. Kind of jump back and forth. Otherwise, you it's like handwriting, you know? You write something and when you start here, by the end of here, you can see where you start and where you end. <coughs> Okay, so ball layout, if you want to take a look at this, uh, just uh, how I did this. I, I kind of started here. Uh, you, you start with the background and then, and then you go in between the veins and carve out the veins. And, uh, uh, and I, this was a ball I had done, I don't know, many years ago. So I just used it for demo here. Then you, I, I had to put it back on the lace because the footing was just kind of flowing in. But if you if you do something like this, you almost need to separate it with a with a bead or something. And uh, by the way, if you do this burning, uh, face burning, that's also not so easy because you have to really speed it up and you have to use uh, 150 grit sandpaper. As, especially it's, it's like a, a paper which has a heavy, heavy paper paper. And I learned this from David Nittman. Uh, that's the way he did all, all his beats with 150. It's difficult to see, like here, here too, it's uh, you. You spin it here, and you want to you want to burn this. You want to burn these uh, lines here. And uh, I always put the tail stock on it because you have to speed it up. You know, burning means speed and pressure because you have to generate the friction for it. So this this layout here, I. If I do this rim here, I develop kind of uh, segments. I think one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. And then I, I just kind of pencil in my leaves the way I like it. And then I just glue on the segments, and I will show this later. And then I just kind of burn right through the, through the paper. So it's easy to do. Well, this is another just uh, just another texturing. It is nothing else, uh, and I because I noticed you have this emerging balls there as well. It's nothing else than just uh, dip, uh, using uh, uh, wood burning, and just it's just very long and painful. Each little one you have to dip in, so that takes takes some time. Now. My suggestion is, if you start doing this kind of things, uh, I thought I had a little spoon here somewhere. Oh, here it is. You may be better off to start with something little, like uh, this little spoon here. And now on this one, you can just pencil the reference line in by hand. But where you don't invest a lot of time, if you start right away with a big piece and you put like 100 hours in or something, <laughs> then uh, and you are not too happy with it. But you, you learn with, with smaller pieces, like this little spoon. Uh, I use the other part of, you know how to do these things. That's the way you, you make these emerging balls. I use the other half here. Uh, to show you how I actually do the painting and as it goes from acrylic painting into a finished a finished product here. So uh, does anybody have any question about uh, layout and design? So this one here is, is a big help to me always, you know, if I do these larger pieces and uh, it actually goes, goes quite quickly. I'm going to take this off here. Do you have any, any question or something? Yeah? Okay. The, the 
big piece, and I'm going to show you, I used uh, the chuck here, the, the carving chuck. And this is from Trent Bosch, is his name. He's in Colorado Springs, I think. And he built this, and they cost about 160 bucks or so. But uh, the smaller ones, I use a, a bag of rice. My, my wife was so nice, she, <laughs> she put this rice bag together. And because you need something, if you, you know, you need something which kind of conforms to your, to your uh, piece so you can hold it. It's, everything is always how to control it, how to control your burning pan, how to control your carving. And uh, that's why if you have a larger piece like this, it's very difficult to hold it. It's, so this one is easy. If you put it on a carving stand, then I have both my hands free and I can, I can kind of control my carving and my burning. So, but uh, a bag of rice or sand or peas. Yeah, I don't like the sand because the sand usually comes, some dust comes through, the rice is clean. <laughs> And it's not going to, to rot anything. So yeah, you almost need something like this. Okay, <laughs> design layout. Uh, equipment, what, what kind of equipment do I use? Uh, let me put this back on here. So this carving stand from Trent Bosch also has a a separate bracket which you can mount on a bench or on a block of wood. So I don't do my carving on the lace like here, but you could, but I, I like to sit down very, very, very comfortable and at, at a lower level. And so I have it just mounted on, on a block of wood and then I have a, um, uh, like a vise where I put it in and uh, then you can you can move it around. So uh, here's another, another tip, which normally it would be better to just finish this off. So this one here is already finished. Uh, if you would finish this off, because if I do it now all this carving and I put maybe, I don't know, 50, 60 hours into it. Now I put it back on the lace and I screw it all up <laughs> and uh, then all your carving is. So do this first and then what you can do is use use a waste, a waste block and use a double-sided tape or use a hot, mel a hot glue. Uh, yeah, hot glue. And because hot glue comes off very easy, but it is also, it helps you. And then you, you just uh, install the, 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 the block in, in, in your jug. And then you have a finished piece, then you, you, you only worry about, you know. The, the other thing is, uh, I wanted to show here on this, uh, areas which I, which I do not carve, I tape off. Because I noticed, first of all, I don't know about you, but sometimes, you know, you get this little kick <laughs> and uh, you, you run into some finished air, some finished surfaces which you don't want to, so tape this off. The other thing is when I do this burning, like, uh, uh, just one second, uh, like this, this burning, you have to really get the heat up. And as you get closer to here, it actually discolors the, the wood. So that prevents to discolor the wood if you put this tape on it. Okay, I'm going to put this back on here. I shall not forget this. <laughs> so, and, and you can see with, with this guy, you can, you can move around, you can move it around any place you want it. 
and then you have your hands free and you can can work like this you know you can hold your your uh, wood burner or whatever the, or the burrs or the carving tool it, you, you are in control it's always can you control the thing so we'll use this afterwards so my my main tools are uh, the burner, the deep, I have the detail master and I bought this many years ago and as far as I read I think you cannot, you may cannot buy it anymore. But there are so many other uh, burning tools out there, razor tip and uh, from, is this a Canadian outfit, razor tip, I think. But there are so many and w w what I did by the way, I made I made just a kind of a summary of of what I do, and on the back side there's tools and materials, and there are websites wi where you can go. Actually, Craft Supply or any of those, they have everything you need. So uh, this is another thing I don't know, Kelly, you want to eventually keep. So, I, most uh, the the one which I use mostly for the outline, if you if you outline these leaves, is uh, is this uh, sharp uh, pen here, and then the second one which I use is where you where you do all these dimples. And I think this one is called 7A and the other one 10A. They have some numbers to, to, to these pins. So, uh, and I, this detail master you can go, I, I don't think you can get anymore. They had some uh, fixed one, fixed pens. And uh, in the last years they came, last year or two, they came out with some removable ones where you can take the tip out and replace it. So I actually uh, burned off one here. And then the way I, I repaired it, I didn't bring this one, I, I just cut it off and then you can buy these connectors at uh, Radi Radio, Shop, uh, Radio Shack. And I put these connectors on it and then you can put your own wires on it. So that, that's, by the way, another way of doing it is you make your own burning tools. And uh, uh, years ago when Greg was still with us, uh, there are some people out there like Molly Winton and one guy from New Zealand, uh, his name escapes me now. Uh, they, they call this not wood burning, they call it branding. And uh, they, use, uh, they, they use a much more power, they use a battery charger to power these things and they glow up and when you push this on the wood, the flames come actually up and they just uh, make their own branding tools. Uh, you can buy these titanium wires and then you just shape it in any way you want it and you make. So that might be a topic for another day, you know, how to do this kind of stuff. So, the wood burner, then the next, uh, the next uh, big thing is carving. What do you use for carving? And uh, when I started, I, I had a little <coughs> scoop like this, and I almost everybody has a Dremel at home, not for carving, but for, a, it just belongs into your toolbox, right? A Dremel <laughs> belongs into your toolbox. And so, but it is too heavy. If you, you know, if you hold it in your hands and your hands getting all tight. And then the next thing I bought, uh, uh, the cheap version of the Fordum with the flexible shaft. So I have one like this at home. And last year <coughs> I took a class in uh, Florida with uh, Dixie Briggs, is Bix is her name. And she's an excellent demonstrator, and she recommended the uh, master carver, a micro carver. 
And just look at this. I mean, this is beautiful, you know, if, if I think about, you know. <laughs> and then you have, and in, in comparison to also to the Fordham, that is just uh, absolutely great. And it has, now, you go with the Dremel, which usually goes to 1800 RPM or something, it has some variable speed on it. Then you have the Fordham, which goes to 25, maybe 30,000 RPM. This micro cover goes to 50,000 RPM. And then you have the dental tools, uh, the NSK, which go to like 320,000 RPM. Because you have this really tiny, tiny thing in order to get enough cutting speed, your speed has to go up. And so this one here is just fabulous. And uh, I hardly use anything else anymore because I just like it because it's so quiet and it, it does a beautiful job. Yep. Then, You know, uh, I was thinking, well, if I come over here, I may need two or three pieces and that's it. But then I was thinking, geez, well, I may should show this and may should show this. And all of a sudden, you end up with three or four boxes of things. But um, the other thing is, uh, I mentioned about the wood burning and the pens. And there is, I don't know, 20 different kinds or even more. So you can find. but. Really, I only need pretty much two or three of those things for what I do. If, if you are a real uh, pyrographer and do this wildlife pictures or so, it's a different story. I'm also not too concerned about when I turn this on and it gets hot. See, they get hot very quickly. But if you now, just use the back of here, if you now see, and you get, usually you get this ugly first. It gets very, very dark. So this wood burner, they usually blow on it and it cools it down a little bit so you don't get this original dip, dip of, uh, uh, but in my case, I don't really care because uh, I use a pretty heavy burn anyway and then Everything is carved around here and here, and then it is it is uh, painted, and so the burning becomes almost secondary. Now here, this uh, cover. Look at this. Uh, the photo has a variable speed, uh, has a flexible shaft. This one, the motor is in your handpiece, and. To open and close it, see how easy this is. That's the way you change your, your burrs. So really, really nice. And they give you this uh, blank here because you, the bushings which are in here, you, you have to make sure you always have something in, otherwise it probably distorts or so. So if you, if you don't put a, have a burr in it, you, you should put this blank in here. What did I do now? make sure I don't screw it up here so I can can still do some work here. <laughs> now see these inserts here uh, the which one here it's very hard to see probably there are different ones uh, you can uh, the sh because you get this burrs in different shank sizes uh, the dental drill and uh, uh, my boys are dentists so I have a big supply of used dental drills and they they have a really tiny they have a really tiny shank but the typical one is 332nd or an eighth of an inch so you can you can exchange these things <laughs> burrs are in all kinds of sizes. 
and uh, here again I and they are not inexpensive I have to say and I want to send this around so you can see how they come how you purchase them and I use mostly uh, Rio Grande and Rio Grande you can go on a website on Rio Grande and it's on my sheet there and uh, they are just excellent it's like two three days later you have them and uh, they are uh, reasonably priced most of those birds are they come from uh, Switzerland or from Germany uh, and you buy them in in six packs like this and this one here is called like a stump we want to send this around that people can see this actually and let me just see if there's one open and you you can get it down to like 0.5 millimeter if you are can picture metric it's about 20 thousandths of an inch I use mostly two, two and a half, one and a half millimeter. This one here is maybe, this one here is a two millimeter round burr. So I use mostly round burrs uh, to, round burrs to just, uh, half away the background and then on, on leaves like this you want to kind of undercut the edges so there is a little shadow line and for this I use the, the stump burrs and if, if the stump burr has maybe some of them they you have to make grind off a little bit and then you can you can use it straight or you can angle it a little bit and that gives you a little shadow line on your leaves which makes it the other thing is i you can make the shadow line just with uh you know with the burner you burn it and you just bring it in like like this now if you have to do a lot of if you have to do a lot of uh, heavy uh, wood removal, you would use some different ones. You would use uh, this kind of burrs, uh, and they are not inexpensive. You know, there's maybe one of those costs 12 or 15 bucks a piece. So where the other ones, this uh, three millimeter and two millimeter, they're actually uh, relatively inexpensive per, you get the six packs, but you may want to show this, these are good if you need to, to remove a lot of wood. Then there are this kind of diamond, they call it the diamond burrs. And to me, they're almost useless. <laughs> they, they do a little burnishing if you want to clean up something and burnish something, but they are, they are as, as far as I'm concerned. If you see them and you get them uh, like uh, 10 bucks, a set, okay, that's what they heard. <laughs> so, um, I do use, uh, so I, I do use sometimes, you know, just sanding sticks and I just uh, use a, a double-sided tape and use my set and, and glue it on one of those uh, sticks and then you, you know, you can put your grit on it. So I use this a lot if I just have to clean up something. Um, what did I want to show you? Oh, too much stuff here. I thought I had some uh, some sanding discs here. Oh, here they are. Here they are. Here they are. Uh, this is uh, also very interesting. Uh, 
you can make your own sanding disk and you know they have you you can buy this you can buy this uh from any of those outfits of those burr outfits and take one apart here and i use a double sided this upwards i use a double sided Because I move around so much, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you can, you can stay right on okay. Over here? Over here? Okay. Uh, you can take a sandpaper and you use one of those tapes. scotch tape. This is a double-sided tape. And it has some cushion in between. So then you glue uh, your sandpaper on each side and it gives you any size you want and it gives you these sanding discs. And they are, with this sanding disc, if you want to clean up, uh, if you want to clean up a little, this is wonderful to do. And uh, it's it's quite inexpensive. You can do it all yourself. You know, you you cut out these discs, and you you get this. What is it called? Uh, mandrels. Mandrel. These mandrels. You you get these mandrels in different sizes, and actually, this uh, this uh, Dixie bricks. She uses the larger mandrel use this uh, tape on it and glues on the mandrel itself uh, a small uh, sanding disc. And then she has these small sanding discs and she can just, you know, sand this off. So really very, very, very nice to do. This one I wanted to just show you. Uh, these are the dental drills. They're really small. And so there's a bushing which goes in just for the dental drills. So you, you can, you have to buy this extra. It does, didn't come with the, with the piece. So if you have a, if you know a dentist, uh, they're always happy to give you the used ones and the used ones are still good enough for wood. So, okay, this one here is a real innovative thing. So you can see there's sanding discs in all shapes and forms in different kind of, in different kind of grids. And this, I wanted to show you, this is the little one. The little one, which she basically just glues right on the mandrel like this. And then you, so you don't have a screw in here, then you can use this uh, for, for fine detail work. Okay, <sighs> I think I lost some here. Yeah, got it. <coughs> Yep. Just work it. Pass this around. Oh, there's another one which is very useful. After you do all your carving, uh, before you put the paint on it, you need to clean it up. And there's several ways to clean it up. Uh, one is just, I, I just, you know, use a brush. Uh, I use a steel brush because any any overburn from the wood burning you want to brush off and to use a steel brush for this. Or here again, you can make your own. This is, uh, I think, some 3M stuff, which you put on the same mandrel. And uh, I'll just show you this maybe quickly. I will. 
I will I, I just have to get this thing out here. So stay over the box. And uh, by the way, this uh, micro pro uh, micro cover has a nice uh, variable speed on it. But you see, then you then you can clean up your carvings, and you get all the little burrs off before you do the actual before you do the actual painting on it. Back in here for later on. Okay, so this, you want to see this as well? Oh, okay. And there, there are all kinds of brushes, as you notice, uh, uh, which you can use, bristles. And some of them are actually quite expensive, so I I'm pretty much do my own and I don't throw away the old toothbrush because the old toothbrush is always very helpful as well. Okay. This, this. Then um, the other material is painting. And when I do my painting, I seal it first with white gesso. And the gesso, you're familiar with gesso, it's just a white pigment, basically. But I dil dilute it 50-50, so it's diluted. It's uh, highly diluted, otherwise it's too thick. And, um, and then, I, then I, I just put the gesso in between here and try not to put too much into the burnings. So it's not that I just wipe it all over it and, and I, I try not to do anything here because this one here uh, will be burned anyway. And I don't want to have any acrylic paint on here and then burn and you get all the fumes on it. So gesso is the first thing. Then I, I typically had enough and let it dry overnight. But if you want to accelerate it, use a, a air dryer or a hair, hair dryer and just, you know, dry it out faster. Then I have, uh, I'm lucky my wife, and I, I, I showed some of, she does some rose marling, so rose, the rose marlers uh, prefer oil. But some of the rose models, because oil has the, is, is not as healthy, so they go to acrylic. And so she has a ton, ton of acrylic paint, which she doesn't use, which I use now. So I use this. It's basically, so there's nothing special. You can buy it any place. Uh, Sonia is one called. And in my, in my case, for these leaves, I, after I put the, uh, white uh, gesso on it, I seal it with the gesso, I put some of those green olive, kind of olive green stuff on it. Then I use some uh, oak, uh, yellow oak, or some yellow stuff, and uh, some uh, brand, brandy wine, brand, and, and you can experiment with different paints, of course. And uh, because I, I kind of like the, the fall colors of it. And then it, it, it basically looks like, looks like this. After you put this paint on it, and if you don't like it, you paint over it. And uh, when I paint it, I, I also dilute it. The paint, the paint is fairly heavy, so I usually have uh, some uh, water there to dilute it. And then comes the kind of magic, and I kind of, uh, stumbled on this by accident. I didn't like my paint and then I thought I'm, I'm just going to scrape it off with a, with a brush. But the only brush which was laying around was a brass brush. And when you, when you take this paint and you, you brush it with a brass 
Fras Frasch. And then it's basically a kappa alloy of uh, kappa and what is it? Tin? Tin? Well, yeah, I would think so. Then it turns in magically <laughs> into this metallic look. And so I started liking this, and that's pretty much the way I do it. So there might be other things uh, which you can do. And uh, uh, Jim Parker, he bought, he bought this Gilders paste, and I have not used it. I just bought it here because I thought I'd just show it to you. The, the Gilders paste basically made in Wisconsin. But you can buy it, and they have it in any color you want, and in metallic, and so and so on. Now, so you may don't even have to do it the way I do it with acrylic paint or anything, and just use Gilders paste. You know that could be very well. Then I use after after I do all this brushing. And I brush as long as I like, you know, until I feel, yeah, that's the way I like it. If you brush forever, it becomes all dark. And, but it, it starts blending, it starts blending these different layers you put on. Uh, as you can see, it starts blending it. And then I say, yeah, okay, that's enough. I do this all before I do actually this background burning. And then, after I do all this brushing, and I like the way it looks, like this one here, then I go and do all this background burning. And after I do the background burning, I uh, take a steel brush, not the brush, take a steel brush and brush it off all the overburns from your, from your background burning. And then I do what's called dry brushing. And you use some pigments and uh, you can use, if you are familiar with Pearl X, uh, you can buy this stuff at Hobby Lobby and mix it up. But we were lucky, uh, Greg Kulibert was a chemist at Appleton Papers Coating. And they, they experimented with different pigments. So we have literally, I don't know, 30, 40 different pigments. And uh, they threw it out and he did some dumpster diving and saved it. And so it's now in my house, stacked up. And in addition to it, there he has an emulsion, a polymer emulsion. So uh, with this polymer emulsion, uh, you can put a drop in it, put some pigments in it, and you make your own paint. And we have it in gold, in silver, in... Uh, uh, turquoise and I don't know what, you know. So we do basically, so here is, for example, that's the way it looks. And be careful, it is very powdery. That's like the gold paint. So if you want to take a look and open it, you're welcome to do so. Here's like my chest, so 50-50, and if it gets too heavy, I put a little more water in it. But you may, but when you open it, don't shake it too much, otherwise, you make it like Goldfinger, you know, Goldfinger from uh, 007. So, but this is, so that's, and when you do the dry brushing, I use a, I use a, like a tile. So I, I use a, a drop, I, I use like a little bit of powder and you don't need much. Use a little bit of powder, use a drop of, of this polymer and then mix it up well, mix it up well and you can see I have done here many times. And then you use a brush. A small brush or a little bit bigger one. And until you hardly until you get nothing off anymore. So you, you rub it in, but you don't, you don't paint. And then you wipe it over, you wipe it over this area. You wipe it over this area. 
and and you can see here and i i i, I will uh, put this around you can see here the highlights so on the on the wood where i did the burning it just hits the highlights and so now you can make it uh, with gold and if you don't uh, if you have too much gold on it maybe you put something else on it you can layer it whatever you want so that's pretty much uh, what i have on equipment all these brushes are bought by the most expensive store, Harbor Freight. <laughs> you can buy all this stuff. So I, it's nothing really inexpensive. Nothing really expensive. It's all inexpensive stuff. The expensive stuff is this guy. It costs two hundred bucks. This micro uh, carver, but I just love it. If you do this stuff, you may as well spend the money, and uh, you know you have fun with it. So I was thinking maybe. We make a little break, coffee break, so you can recover from my accent. Listen to more Austrian accent. <laughs> uh, okay, I just, uh, item three, just a little hands on. Uh, it's not going to be uh, taking too long because, <coughs> you know, just looking at how somebody coughs and burns is like uh, watching paint drying. But on a on a ball like this, the first thing I, I I do is I lay I lay it out and typically maybe make six segments and <coughs> I use the, the correct uh, radius and then I just pencil it out the way I like it. Okay, and uh, usually I sit in front of the TV and try to sketch off some different things until I. I, I have something which I like. Then I cut it out in in this segments, and then I I actually I copied copy it off. If you have a copy, I need about six segments, and then I just take a, a glue stick like this. And this glue stick doesn't leave a lot of. It's easy to to uh, pull it off again. It is not like Elmer's glue, you know, which, which really tacks it down. So it just kind of tacks it down. Now, if you, if you are really uh, artistic, you know, you may don't do it this way. You may just pencil it in uh, yourself. Uh, the only thing, just where you have the, over, the overlapping leaves, make sure you erase uh, the leaf, you know, if you have a, a line coming through here, or you, I guarantee you, you burn right into this line, which you are not supposed to burn into. So, you put this on, it's easy enough to burn right through the wood, uh, uh, through the paper. So, let's try. I'm, I'm usually, I start with a little bit lower heat, and then, and, and all I do in this case is, <laughs> Oh, that's why. <laughs> All I do is basically try to get the outlines. And after the paper comes off, I may have to go back over it because it might not be enough. So, and you see, that's what I mean. Uh, I'm, I'm, my, I'm not as steady. You know, some people have a really nice and steady hand. I'm not, so I I need to kind of uh, try to, and then you try to do burn this in a like in wood like in wood turning. You want this fluid motion, you know, otherwise you don't get the leaves in. Then uh, burn in the center here, and it could be a little bit hotter. So. You have this different tile, so I go maybe a little harder. And you see, sometimes you can actually see it. It's the red tip on it. Burning and talking is maybe not so good. <laughs> So I'm not going to do a lot. I just wanted to show you the process. 
And it's interesting how different the hardness of the wood sometimes is, you know, as you cross over the fibers and Well, I, I show you something. This this guy is this detail master was one of the first one, and they had they you know they made the patented thing, and actually you had these O rings on here, but I I just used a cork from a wine bottle, and put it on because it still got very hot, and. Yeah, I put the cork on it, and and it feels better in the hand too. It's a little larger in diameter, and still, uh, I don't know. After five, five or ten minutes, it gets very hot. Then it it would be nice to have actually two where you can just it cools down fairly quickly again, but uh, it it still gets quite hot actually. So I don't know. There might be other ones out there, and I'm thinking. Uh, let me just see here. Uh, and you can get this all from uh, woodcraft, uh, woodburning.com, woodworker.com, mastercover.com. They, they all have, have this uh, wood burning uh, equipment. And this detail master, to my knowledge, I think I read something recently, uh, was bought up by somebody, but uh, the guy does not produce it anymore. So. But like I said, you know, make your own. It's always <laughs> really that difficult to make your own. And then you buy these nichrome wires and you get it in different gauges, uh, 18, 20, 22. Uh, you hammer it so you get, get an, a nice sharp knife and you shape it in any way you want it, you know. And you can, can can make your own if you don't want to. Because they are expensive. I think I paid, and that was maybe 12 years ago, some $170 just for this unit here. And the pens were always very expensive. They were like 27 bucks a piece. And so, okay. So, yeah, I, I use this cork because it protects you a, a little bit. And then, you see, I, I just carve this in, and it, it really is only going to be the layout. And then uh, the veins, I usually just put them in freehand. I don't have a template for this. So. See what I'm saying here? If, uh, I don't know whether you can see it, where you start. Now the biographer, they would not like something like this because it's very, very heavy burned where you start. So they kind of blow on it, or Jerry told me they have a, a wet towel, which they wipe quickly over to just bring the temperature down, and then you have a more uniform uh, a burn, but I don't really care too much because as I turn this over here, I need to probably re-burn re, uh, it anyway. See how easy it comes off from with these two glue sticks. But you can also, after you burn all this stuff here, you can actually just carve right through the paper as well. They just try to to bring in the have kind of a fluid motion in
Okay, enough burning, I guess. So the, the tip actually cools down fairly quickly. So you can, can touch it actually as, as this little. So the next thing I, I actually do, so I have all this burned and let me just turn this around a little bit here. Okay, here we go. This is when you don't have your own, own tools. <laughs> so eventually you, I end up with something like this, okay? And, and as you can see, the paper comes easily off. So I, I, I end up with, with something like this, and the first thing I use a uh, two and a half, three millimeter, three millimeter is one eighth of an inch, or maybe even a little bit smaller. And you don't have to really crank it up. I use like, I don't know what it is, maybe 25,000, 30,000 RPM here. It doesn't really tell you what it is. I just look low, high. And look at how, how nice and quiet this is. Let me get this a little closer to here. And I just want to tell you, I have at home, I have, I, I'm, I'm sitting there, and I have a small shop vac, a really tiny one. You can buy this, uh, I don't know, a gallon or half a gallon shop vacs. And as I, as I devel develop, because I don't have any exhaust system, as I develop this dust or so, I just take the shop vac and just suck it off. So here, the first thing you do, you do all your background here. And see, that's why I like to tape this off in case I, I get a little jerk, you know. <laughs> I hope that I don't. And as you do, I have to get me some, have to get me some brush here. That's where the old toothbrush comes handy. And after you get all this background uh, with the with a round burr, and they hold. You know, it depends. The the, the cherry wood is the nicest one for me to work on. It, it is nice for wood burning, it is nice for carving. If you have this hard maple burl, it's a little bit more difficult. So after you got all this background down, like on this, on this bowl here, so I wouldn't even start inside here, I make all this background. Then you change your burr into a real, in a small one or Uh, yes, but it's they call this a uh, stump, stump burr, stump uh, burr, and I actually is it. I actually let me just see. Here we go. I ground it off the tip. I ground the tip off, so the tip is not, and you can you can use it now this way vertically or you can also bring it in here because you want your leaves not round you want it straight or actually you would like to have even a little bit of an undercut in it it gives you these shadows so after after we do all this it's just basically removing wood this background See how easy it is to change things? And then you, 
you go in and you see you can you can come in from the side first maybe now that's where the magnifying gas comes in So sometimes, like this uh, Dixie Briggs, she goes in white straight, and she comes. That's the way she outlines her pieces with a stump cutter like this. I, I just don't feel very, very easy with this. So I'm, I'm using the round ones, and then I kind of clean up my edges, because you can go back after you do this burning here. You can go back with this one here and actually burn the undercut into it as well. So uh, then after you do all this uh, background, then I, now I'm using the same one. I go to a smaller one, like a, this is like an eighth of an inch, which is three millimeter. I usually go to like a two millimeter. And you go inside and to the inside here. And, and you try to get as close as possible to your burn lines, but do not, you don't want to, you see, you constantly have to kind of look and you don't want to go over the burn line. You want to keep the burn line like I show it here, that you still see the burn lines here. So that uh, takes a little bit. And, and then I, I try to carve, you know, how the leaves kind of uh, usually from the outside or from the inside. So that's why the magnifying glass is, is becoming more and more important, particularly as you get older. And then you in, into the tiny corners, uh, then you go to a smaller bit, like a one millimeter and you, you can, uh, uh, you know, get into these tiny corners where you cannot get in with this big one. If necessary, and you, you carve over the burning line, you just go back and reburn it. You know, it's not after you put the paint on it and everything, it kind of uh, uh, gets anyway uh, equalized. So. After you do all this carving, and as you can see, it takes a while to do it, then you have to clean it up. And, and that's where I, I don't do any, any sanding really, but there's always a lot of fuss around it, and I prefer what is it, scotch, scotch, uh, you know, sand uh, for, yeah, scotch bread. And, and I, I just cut it out, you know, little disc, larger one. They become, the larger ones become very quickly smaller anyway. <laughs> and, and turn, turn the speed down. You don't really want to do this too fast. And then you, you just clean it up. Maybe a little faster. So any, anywhere you do the carving, here it's not that important because you still go over here. They they call this uh, uh, your texture is background, 
and then you texture it again with wood burning, double texturing, they, they, some of the, the guys call it. So after this is done, you may have to go back and reburn some of the lines. This, this line here got a little bit thin, so you, you may just go back and carefully darken it up a little bit. So, something like this. Okay. So, as, as you can see, uh, doing the background, doing the inside carving, that takes a while. And that's, that's pretty much most of your, of your work. The painting is, is not really that bad. So, as I told you, I use for painting, I use this gesso. And you can buy this gesso at Hobby Lobby or any place. And they come actually in white or in black. And uh, there's a guy, Chuck Versary is his name, and he makes these beautiful pieces. And he goes and puts black gesso or black Indian ink first. He goes from a black or dark background into a white one or into a lighter background. You know, that's the way he does it, okay? So you can do it any way you want. But I use, I use like this little brushes here and just, so you just make a little and try not to put too much into the, into my burnt areas. So that Actually, the, with the white gesso, that takes a little more time because you want to seal, you want to seal the whole area. Where, and if you if you if you get into the burnt areas, uh, you may have to go over again, you know, and burn it a little bit. But remember, this is all kind of acrylic stuff. You kind of burn like through plastic. So now you go do this through the whole area with, with this gesso. I, have, I usually have, if it is too heavy, I put a, bit, a little bit uh, more water into it. Make sure you have always water around it where you can clean up your brush. And then, by the time I get through this whole thing, I'm sick and tired of it, and I let it sit overnight to dry it. But you could use a hair dryer and maybe just accelerate it. If you just use a small piece like this, uh, just in the beginning, you, you, you don't want to wait. You know, you want to see results. Like we would turn us always want to re see results quick. So the next thing, Maybe I should, did I bring a hair dryer? I think I did bring one. Okay, so the next thing is, I may just use this piece as a demo. I, I just layer on different colors. I usually start with the green. Okay, here we go. I usually start with the green first, uh, then uh, maybe some yellow. In this case, because uh, it's like a gink ginkgo leaf, I didn't want to put any reddish in it. I, so I just have, and the ginkgo leaf, as they turn in the fall, they become really yellowish. And so I, I mostly use in this case, a green and yellow and a little couple of uh, streaks of blue. And so you can experiment with these things. So, and in between, you can, you can now do your uh, drying with the, with the hair dryer. Then comes the magic. And like I told you, most expensive piece from, <laughs> from Harbor Freight and they, they come in a, in a set of three. There's one brass, 
I want stainless steel and one some acrylic kind of brush. But it's, it, there might be some better ones out there. You don't want really, you know, want kind of semi-soft one. And as you, as you see this acrylic paint, uh, it doesn't really look much, but if you now brush it, and I'm just going to use a little bit here, and that's the way I got it. I thought I didn't like it. I want to brush it off. You see how it how it changes how it changes the color. It be, it gets this metallic look actually. And now here I brushed maybe a little bit too much. And it, if you brush too much, it gets too dark. So you you have to just brush it slightly until you get to a point which you like. And it doesn't work with a steel brush. It only works with a brass brush, and has something to do with the with the copper alloy. So you can have this little, or you get the bigger ones, you know. And you just brush it until you until you feel, and it blends things together. You can see now how the the different colors blend together. Now, the next thing I do is. I do actually the bur I burn the background, and you can see here as I, I I protected this edge again because I want to keep this edge uh, natural. If you come with your burner close to it, it discolors this edge. So this tape is only to prevent discoloration. So. I had the other, okay. So for, for this background burning, I use this number, I think it's called 77A, seven, seven and it, it's, just, it's just a dip like this. And I use it a lot because you can imagine how, how many dimples there, <laughs> there are in. And you want, you want the dimples in such a way that you do not see, you do not see a wood surface anymore. You want it all burned. So, and then you have to crank it up a little bit more. Is there? Oh, here we go. Must have by accident. Must have. So you get to get it. So. So here, here, here we go. See, just burn, and that's where you need your magnifying glasses. But you just burn this in, and as I said, as you get closer to here, if you don't protect this, the rim would be discolored. But so here you, and you want to get close to here. Now, the secret is you don't want you want it as randomly as possible, these dots. You don't want like a, a row of dots or something. So if you, let's say if you just start here, and you use kind of a row of dots, I usually go back and try to dis disrupt this row because you want, you want it looking as randomly as possible. But it gives you something, it, uh, how should I say, it helps you to forgive some of your maybe not so good carvings. And it gives a beautiful, I, I just love the background of it. Then, then you have to clean up the overburn and the overburn you clean up with a stainless steel brush, which I thought I had. And then you can see sometimes, ah, it's not completely burnt. You still can see some wood, you know. And then it, you just go back and, and try to uh, equalize this. But try to be as randomly, when you put the starts in, as randomly as possible. You don't want to see real rows, you know, having like soldiers. Uh, 
Then, the ne see there is a lot of little steps actually. Then the next thing is, I'm, I'm using these pigments. So this is this gold pigments, and I'm not going to put any on it here, but I just show you how little you really need. So you have a couple of pigments, and I don't know, uh, it, it's, it's messy to fill it up, but if somebody really wants to get into it, and I talk to my UP6 buddies, then uh, I'm sure we can share some of those pigments. And must have. Uh -huh. have to open it. This is this polymer. Uh, glue it up here. So going to use a little stick here. And all, all it takes is really a little drop of it. You use this drop of this uh, polymer. Now from this polymer we don't have too much of it, unfortunately. And then, but you, you could use now, and, and I don't know whether you can find, this polymer uh, basically dries clear. Okay, so you could use like pearl eggs which you can buy from, uh, uh, from uh, Hobby Lobby, and then you just blend it up, mix it up like this, Use a brush, and for this, I use a little bit wider and stiffer brush, and just fill the brush with these pigments, and then, actually I usually blend it here, and then just take it off, and you can see it just barely, barely uh, anything comes off, and then you, and I, I will, I will Go over here one more time here a little bit. There's something missing anyway. And then you just kind of brush it over. And it just highlights everything. And you can go over over here as well. And it gives you this gold. Now you can put another layer on copper or silver or what whatever you have. And but just use it very, very lightly. Otherwise, you know, uh, you, do, you don't want to ex uh, here. Here I purposely try to make it more colorful, you know. Here I like to keep the, the burned areas and just highlight, you know, highlight the top a little bit. So then you let it dry. Best thing, you let it dry overnight. Cover everything which you do not want to uh, protect and Spray it with fixative, workable fixative. And this workable fixative you can buy, I think, uh, at Hobby Lobby. And what it does, I learned this from uh, Andy Wolf. It's actually made for, for drawings with uh, charcoal or so. It prevents that you smear it afterwards. And it will definitely not smear off. If you use some uh, shellac or something which has some solvents in it, you know, it may dilute your paint and, and it may just uh, smear over everything. So this fixative works well. I just spray it very lightly. It dries 10 minutes and you, you put another one on it. And that usually should do it. I just, I just protect everything which I don't want, you know, which I want to keep a nice finish, my finish, my wood finish on it. I protect it with something. So the fixative, in this case, I would just put this down. This is protected, and then I just spray this whole thing. Okay, <laughs> I'm good.